Secretary. So I'm Megan Leck, and as Millie uh, mentioned, I'm a basin analyst, and a basin analyst is someone who studies sedimentary basins. And uh, as um, Andrew mentioned, we don't explore for mineral and petroleum deposits, but what we do is explore for mineral systems and petroleum systems, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. So as, as background, um, geology, well, it's the science of the Earth's history and its structure and its life forms, and this is all recorded in the rock record. And um, we as geologists um, need to understand the concepts and the processes um, that um, form hydrocarbons and mineral deposits to um, predict their presence. And as the geologists, we reconstruct geological history, so we're kind of detectives, I guess, to identify where you might find petroleum reservoirs and mineral deposits. So, warning, um, the stuff in here kind of follows on from Geology 101, so um, some of the concepts um, are hopefully um, you've already covered. So this steps back to what Andrew was talking about, uh, about um, that, well, Australia is endowed with quite a lot of um, mineral and, and energy exports, and iron ore and, um, and coal are the two major um, exports for us. But we, we do have um, a lot of other minerals that export and, and help make Australia what it is. So if we look at the, um, the elements that form our petroleum and mineral systems, um, I might mention that I'm talking about the conventional systems, which I'll explain a, a bit later. They both have a source, um, whether that be an organic source or a, a, a metal source within a rock. Um, both systems go through some sort of maturation process. In petroleum, the, um, the source rock is heated um, to a temperature um, by which the oil and gas can be released um, from the source rock. And for, for minerals, the, the metals are leached from um, the source rock um, and go through a, a migration process until they find a, a trap with hydrocarbons, it is structural and stratigraphic, um, but in minerals you have, uh, in addition, chemical traps. And uh, the fluid in the petroleum systems is obviously um, accumulated and kept, whereas in minerals that fluid escapes, and that is what creates a geochemical footprint that we're able to explore for. And both of the systems need to be preserved. Um, some of that is, well, is, it's often for hundreds and millions of years um, and un until today so that we can, we can find it. So mineral systems are a little bit more diverse than petroleum systems as they have additional tectonic settings and they've got different chemical characteristics for the host rock and the ore fluid. And as far as the geochemical footprints goes, uh, the scale of the mineral systems uh, ends up being much larger. Um, sometimes that geochemical footprint is absent, but it doesn't mean that we can't, we can't find them. So if we start with petroleum systems, there is a whole heap of jargon. We've got condensate, wildcat, crude oil, trap, Kelly bushing, lead, maturity, there are so many terms. That, um, some of them are even quite crude. Here we have poo. Well, it's actually not poo, it's pull out of hole, and that relates to pulling up the, um, the instruments after you've, you've logged a hole. And if you're interested in finding out um, about terms, Schlumberger has an oil and gas glossary, um, which I still refer to as well, uh, which is a great resource. So, um, Petroleum systems are um, a little bit like Goldilocks. They can be a bit fussy. They can't be too deep or too shallow. They can't be too early or too late. They can't be too hot or too cold. They have to be just right. So next we're going to um, have a bit of a look at a video that tells you a bit more about oil and gas. High energy fuels are non-renewable resources that took millions of years to form. About two billion years ago, marine organisms like algae and microscopic animals and plants 
died and settled on the ocean floor. Beneath other sediments in the ocean, and in the absence of oxygen, these fossils changed into a substance called keratin. Under heat and pressure, keratin gradually... Okay, we're going to stop it there. Um, but I guess oh, we'll have a bit of an idea of where we're, we're heading. Uh, so you have um, oil and gas forming uh, by the process of the organic matter falling. You've got the sediment um, accumulating uh, and uh, it's set, it all accumulates in sedimentary basins. And in Geology 101 they talked about the rock cycle and um, here we have the erosion and transport um, via rivers, the deposition of the sediment in sedimentary basins, uh, and it's buried and compacted until it forms a sedimentary rock. So up the top here, we have a range of sedimentary basins that we can go exploring in. Some are within a continent and some are offshore. Uh, the sedimentary basins are large spaces where the sediments can accumulate to considerable thickness and these need to be preserved over long um, geological periods of time. So here we have the river flowing out um, through um, uh, swamps and floodplains. This is where you can accumulate the organic matter that ends up being deposited um, with other sediments into a, a basin to form coal, um, and oil and gas as well. We have quite a number of sedimentary basins in Australia and they cover a wide variety of ages, right from um, quite recent through to um, the Archean, uh, which is a billion or so years ago. Uh, what we're interested in um, with oil and gas exploration um, within my team is mostly offshore in these sedimentary basins here. So here we have some modern examples of sedimentary um, well, processes that are forming sedimentary basins at the moment. We have the Okavango Delta, which is a great place to go and see different animals. We have Lake Eyre here, which is um, accumulating a, a lot of salt, which can be um, a great seal for oil and gas deposits. And here we have the, the Great Barrier Reef and the, the carbonates that are forming there, the corals, uh, can form really good reservoirs. So we have um, swamps and peat bogs here. Uh, they provide really great organic matter for um, for source rocks, and here we have an example of um, a, a delta, uh, the Nile Delta. You can actually see that that triangular delta shape there, where the name comes from. Um, it's the the bread bowl for um, Egypt, but these are the sorts of environments um, that we go searching for when we're looking for oil and gas. And here's a sedimentary basin that we've got quite close to home. It's Lake George. And uh, as you drive to Sydney, you'll come along here and you'll notice this, um, this range of hills here, which um, has been formed by a fault that, is pro well, that helps Lake George when um, we have enough rain to accumulate um, sediment and, and water. But we can look down uh, below Lake George and there's actually um, a few hundred cent uh, centimetres, a few hundred metres of um, sediment under there. And sedimentary basins can provide all sorts of resources. They, can, um, they have groundwater, hydrocarbons and minerals, and they also record past climates, um, which is a, a really Im Im important and valuable thing as well. So it's around about morning tea time, so I thought that we could um, start digesting uh, sponge cake. And uh, we're going to start um, with the porous um, part of the cake, uh, which uh, we've layered with some cream. And uh, it's kind of analogous for sedimentary basins because uh, sedimentary basins um, have porous sandstone and um, sealing units, those mudstones that can help seal um, those porous sandstones, 
can also have an organic content like the cream here does. Um, and when it's cooked, um, it can separate out as cream does um, with oil. And what we want is a really light and fluffy porous sponge cake, porous uh, reservoir. Uh, but it also needs to be um, permeable uh, for the, and those pores to be connected. So if we were to pour um, a delicious sauce over the top, maybe something light like maple syrup or whatever, depending on how far it gets into the cake, um, depends on uh, whether we have um, porous and permeable reservoir and whether um, we have effective seals that can trap um, the, the liquid, uh, the fluids from moving around. And it's the same if you're approaching it from the other end, from the bottom. So now we'll look at the components of a petroleum system. Well, petroleum systems have a pod of active source rock. Uh, the source rock is down the bottom here um, and it's genetically related to the oil and gas accumulations. Um, in conventional systems, like this one here, all the elements are separate. So here we have the source rock that's been buried by all of this sediment, um, compacted, turned into rock, and buried. if it's buried to the right um, temperature and has the right pressure, we start to mature this source rock and expel the oil and gas. And so it's able to migrate through the, the, the porous rock um, and into structures like this here um, if there is a seal over the top and be, be kept there for um, long geological time. So with unconventional systems, some of the elements are combined. So what this means is here you have your source rock and it might have um, been buried uh, to the right temperature to start um, producing oil, but it hasn't got to the point where you're getting migration. So this is the, the source rock, but it's also the reservoir. So where do we look um, for oil and gas? Well, if you take that sponge cake and you squeeze it, um, I haven't actually done that, and, but um, you may find that you get some, some structuring of that, um, that cake. And here we have a, a fold here that the oil and gas has, is migrating from the, their mature source rock into an, an anticlinal structure. And it has a nice sealing mudstone over the top. Here we have another structural trap um, where you have slippage of um, the rocks and they offset to, so that you may get a trap here in the, the porous reservoir and you could get the, the mudstones trapping that in on either side. Now the structural traps are the ones that are most common in oil and gas exploration, but we do also have stratigraphic traps and that relates to variations in the rock strata. So here is an example where we've got some limestone and this part of the limestone is, is permeable. So oil and gas is able to migrate through there and as it migrates through, you might get to an impermeable limestone, one that doesn't have good porosity and permeability and it can get trapped there underneath the ceiling mud rock. So, Petroleum systems are a bit like a souffle. Um, they're really tricky to form. You need your source rock. So I can't actually see it on the screen anymore. We might have run down. You have uh, a source rock um, and then you obviously need your reservoir rock to accumulate your oil and gas and you need a seal over all of that and rock on top of that to allow it to be um, buried and compacted um, to, to the right depth. After that we need to form a trap um, and uh, once all of those ingredients are in place we need um, some generation and migration of that oil and gas and that comes at a critical moment. Just like the souffle, which I've, I've never made, um, you've got to get out of the oven at the right time um, or it'll all go to pieces. It's the same with petroleum systems. It all has to come together at that critical moment and then it needs to be preserved um, over long geological periods of time until we go exploring for it today. 
Now I'd like some audience participation if I can. We're going to do some myth buster, um, a myth buster exercise. So I'm going to ask some questions and if you think it's, it's true, it's confirmed, I'd like you to do a big C in the air. If you think um, it's not true and it's busted, I want you to wave your hands around in the air. And if you think it's plausible, you can put your hands on your head. So here we have the first question. Oil is mostly dinosaur bones. So you can do confirmed, plausible or busted. Okay, we've got quite a lot of waving around in the air. I think that's the most, most common. Well, oil um, and gas are fossil fuels and it's a graveyard of mostly plants and microscopic animals. So you, you can get um, oil and gas from, from dinosaurs, but um, that's not what it's mostly, so we've, we've busted that one. The next one is oil and gas is trapped underground in caverns and pools. So we've got confirmed, plausible or busted. So we've got quite a lot of waving around in the air there. I think that's the, the most common one. Well, generally, no. Um, it relies, as we've seen, I can see that we've all got some really promising geologists out there. It relies on the tiny pore spaces between the grains. But it is plausible. Um, you can get um, spaces within carbonate rocks in particular, but it's, it's really um, not that common. And myth number three is the earth has limited, limitless oil and gas reservoirs. So what do we think there? Confirmed, plausible or busted? We've got plausibles and busteds. Well, um, oil and gas is non-renewable and it can take millions of years to form. Uh, so that one's busted. So now we can move on to other types of energy resources. We do have oil and gas, um, but we've also got uranium and we've got coal. You can see up north near Ranger, um, south in South Australia. We've got some sedimentary basins on the east coast where we get our coal. But we've also got alternate energy sources, um, resource capabilities, for example, um, wind and uh, wave energy down the, on the, the in southern Australia, and we've also got some really big tidal ranges up around um, Broome and northwestern Australia, which could be harnessed for tidal energy. Another thing that I'd also like to mention is carbon capture and storage. Now that's something um, Geoscience Australia has been doing over the past um, little while, and it relates to catching that carbon dioxide out of the air and, and changing it to a liquid uh, and injecting it back under the layers of the earth. So some of our gas fields have high CO2, it can be used as an application there, but it also can be used to um, capture um, CO2 from industrial sources um, and in inject it into the layers of the earth. And uh, as you saw in, in one of the previous slides, um, with the, the various stratigraphic and structural traps. We um, use those for, for carbon capture and storage as well. And um, like oil and gas, the, the carbon dioxide can be stored for um, millions of years. So petroleum has used, the, uh, high, well, the oil and gas industry has used the petroleum system concept um, for quite a number of years now. And the idea is that you're able to uh, um, predict um, where oil and gas might be undercover, under the layers of the earth. So you take all of the different elements that form um, petroleum systems and you group them and fingerprint them. Mineral systems are more div diverse because they've got differing tectonic settings and different chemical characteristics for their, their um, host rock and ore fluid. But um, minerals is also using this technique. So the cube on the side here gives you an idea of um, the breadth of the, the different types of mineral deposits that we get in Australia. Um, and we get them all around Australia. The mineral systems approach um, takes all of the geological factors that control the generation and preservation of mineral deposits. It's the same as petroleum. 
And here is an example of a conceptual mineral, mineral system where you have um, your metal source in, in your rock and you um, leach it from that rock and, and transport it um, in fluid to a, to a trap, um, whether that be structural, stratigraphic or chemical. And the fluid then exits uh, and creates the geochemical footprint. So we're going to take a, well, a step out and have a look at the, the tectonic setting of the world. And if you look at Australia there, at the moment it's sitting smack bang in the middle, middle of the Australian Indonesian plate and it's quite happy there, it's all stable and it just hangs around and um, doesn't do a lot. Um, compared to other places in the world where you have your subduction zones um, in the black and your spreading centres in the red that, that help move um, the, the tectonic plates around. So first we're going to look over in the Andes and uh, Australia used to have environments like um, you have uh, along the South American co coast at at the moment, where you have um, the oceanic crust subducting underneath the continental crust, which is the orange there, um, the, the oceanic crust, which, which is in the blue, can um, get heated and uh, it can cr create volcanoes like the, the Andean volcanoes. Um, and in those, um, that tectonic setting, you can get um, deposits like um, what we see at Copper Hill, Mount Lyle, Rosebery and Mount, Mount Keith in Australia. So this is what um, the Andes looked like. This is what Australia um, may have looked like in some places um, way back. Uh, but this is what we have now. Uh, here's Mount Lyle in Tasmania. You can still see um, remnant mountains there, um, but certainly not the exploding mountains that you get over in South America. Next, we're going to go to the Himalayas. Australia had tectonic settings um, that were similar to the Himalayas. We had the continental crust in orange pushing against um, more con continental crust until it buckled up to create huge mountain ranges. And as that was happening, mineral deposits were forming in those environments. You, we've got Cobar, the Golden Mile, and Leonard Shelf. So here we have um, the Himalayas. And here we have Cobar. We have no huge mountain ranges there um, anymore, but by taking that mineral systems approach, by understanding that tectonic history at a regional scale, we can go to Cobar. We don't need those big mountain ranges to understand um, where we might find mineral deposits in that area. And last, we're going to go to Africa. Uh, we're going to go to the East uh, African Rift where we're having continental crust being pulled and stretched. And as that happens, um, it gets heated from below um, and creates mineral deposits in there. Uh, and Broken Hill and Cannington in Queensland were formed in this way. So here we have the East African Rift in Afar with volcanoes and huge lava fields. And here we have Cannington in Queensland, which is um, a, a very old and eroded landscape um, where we have um, a few rivers creeping around over the top. So here we have um, a map of Australia with some of the major mineral deposits on it. The areas, uh, the brighter areas, are the areas where we have um, fresh rock or, or rock um, at the surface of the earth. And the, the more faded areas are the areas of cover. Now cover is anything between fresh rock and fresh air. So the distribution of mineral deposits, um, energy and groundwater are determined by the geological processes that form them, like the mineral systems that we saw earlier. And because of that, they can be clustered into um, geological provinces. So up um, we've got the yellow, uh, well, the, the faded yellow um, iron ore deposits up in northwest Western Australia. We've got belts for nickel um, up around Mount Isa in northwest Queensland. We've got copper and zinc. 
But if you focus um, up on the copper and zinc um, near Mount Isa, you know you can see there that they they have a quite abrupt stop, and that abrupt stop is not related to the tectonic setting. It's more related to the fact that we start to go under the cover and they're more difficult to find. So we need um, techniques in order to help explore further under the cover. And that's what the undercover program is all about at the moment. So you've probably heard enough about how mineral and petroleum systems are formed. And now I'll um, let Aki have a chat about um, mineral uh, exploration techniques. <laughs>